The Beatles' The Long and Winding Road depicts quite succinctly the demise of the lads from Liverpool as a band and the incredible journey they had on the way. A forlorn Paul McCartney is witnessing his greatest achievement dissolve, and the future seems lonely, bleak, and scariest of all, different. Where is the road? Where is it leading to? Today, we're going to show you 10 very interesting facts about the Beatles' The Long and Winding Road. The world is not as American-centric as many Americans might think. However, if you want to make it in media, it really doesn't hurt to win the state's affection. And after reaching number one on the Billboard's Hot 100s a total of 20 times, the band would end up getting the last American Beatles single to the top of the pop charts after it was officially announced they had broken up. Imagine being such a powerhouse of a band that you topped the charts after it was over. It seems a theme in our last few episodes has been the Beatles emulating other vocalists during their latter years. Perhaps this in and of itself gives us insight into the mind of the band on the brink, wanting to sound like something else instead of what they already are. Paul enlisted the inspiration of Marianne Faithful for Here, There, and Everywhere, John used Smokey Robinson for I'm So Tired, and now Paul is channeling one of the greatest American songwriters ever, the legendary Ray Charles. And you may be thinking, Paul sounds nothing like Ray Charles in this song. Well, he wouldn't disagree with you, but it's very interesting to see how he arrived at this characterization, Paul says. It doesn't sound like him at all, because it's me singing, and I don't sound anything like Ray. But sometimes you get a person in your mind, just for an attitude, just for a place to be, so that your mind is somewhere rather than nowhere, and you place it by thinking, oh, I love that Ray Charles, and think, well, what might he do then? So that was in my mind, and would have probably had some bearing on the chord structure of it, which is slightly jazzy. I think I could attribute that to having Ray in my mind when I wrote that one. What's pretty cool is that Ray Charles actually recorded The Long and Winding Road for his album Volcanic Action of My Soul in 1971. Paul is sentimental, unapologetically so. And while these were dark times in music, think about who the Beatles influenced, not just throughout time, but in the 60s. Everyone was trying to figure out how these kids from a dark town were dominating the airwaves for the last several years. Now it was over? Surely that stressed everyone out, but it seems Paul wasn't taking it easily. George seemed excited to quit. John would have rather been with Yoko than with the band. What was fab was becoming a fad and it couldn't have been an easy situation, Paul says. It's a rather sad song. I like writing sad songs. It's a good bag to get into because you can actually acknowledge some deeper feelings of your own and put them in it. It's a good vehicle. It saves having to go to a psychiatrist. Songwriting often performs that feat. You say it, but you don't embarrass yourself because it's only a song, or is it? You are putting things that are bothering you on the table and you are reviewing them. But because it's a song, you don't have to argue with anyone. I was a bit flipped out and tripped out at that time. It's a sad song because it's all about the unattainable, the door you never quite reach. This is the road that you never get to the end of. Considering the creation of the song and the absolute turmoil the band was in, it makes sense that all that pain and mental stress was coming from the Beatles finally coming to an end. There may not have been an actual yellow submarine, or newspaper taxis, or even a magical mystery tour, but this sure was a long and winding road, and Paul lived just next to it at his farm in Scotland. B842, 16 miles of country road that twist and turn near Paul McCartney's Hyde Park farm in Scotland. Paul had bought the 200-acre property alongside a farmhouse in June 1966, and it was there that Paul wrote the song, taking inspiration from its wild country weather. Paul remembers saying, I just sat down at my piano in Scotland, started playing and came up with that song, imagining it would be done by someone like Ray Charles. I have always found inspiration in the calm beauty of Scotland, and again, it proved the place where I found inspiration. Ah, this is a most magical story. You're going to love it. Do you remember Alistair Taylor, previously Brian Epstein's assistant, later general manager of the Apple Corps? Well, Alice's nickname was Mr. Fixit, as he was quite hands-on in orchestrating the going-ons in the Beatles' lives. After a dreadfully difficult week at EMI Studios, where Alistair was working 20-hour days being Paul's personal assistant and maintaining the office, Alistair was exhausted and was looking forward to spending the weekend at his home with his wife, Leslie. As he was winding down and getting ready to go home, he searched for Paul to say goodnight. The rest of the Beatles had no idea where Paul was, and he couldn't find 
find him in the canteen or any of the offices, so Alistair practically gave up. But just then, as Alistair passed the absolutely massive Studio One, he notices a glimmer of light. There by its glow sat a figure picking away at notes on a grand piano, singing gently a melody that could have only come from Paul McCartney. Alistair recalls being spellbound as he nearly drifts towards Paul, lifted by the sound like in an old cartoon. Paul notices him and stops playing. Alistair says, that is a beautiful, beautiful melody and fabulous words. Leslie would love that. Paul smiled and replied, it's just an idea at this stage. And Alistair laughed for, just an idea, it's sensational. Paul looked up to the control room and asked if there was any tape left. And the engineer nodded, yes. Roll it please, Paul says, as he ran through the song once more. Alistair hearing it again knew it would be a classic. He applauded gently when Paul finished, and Paul turns to Alistair and says, Glad you like it. Now go home. You look shattered. The next Monday, Alistair was back in the office early in the morning. Paul came round to his office in the afternoon and sat down. Paul asked, How is Leslie? She's fine, said Alistair. Did you tell her about the song? asked Paul. No, Alistair laughed. I couldn't do it justice. Well, you can now, said Paul, as he, with an ear-to-ear -ear grin, hands Alistair an acetate record. That's the recording from Friday. It's for Leslie, Paul says. Now you have the only copy of that recording in the world. Alistair, quite understandably moved, asked Paul what the title of the song was, and Paul replies, The Long and Winding Road. Many years later, after Alistair Taylor's passing in 2004, no one knew where the tape ended up. The only demo of Paul McCartney is The Long and Winding Road. But I think telling this story is a close second to hearing it. There was actually almost another cover by a massive superstar of The Long and Winding Road. None other than Tom Jones. Tom says, I saw him in a club called Scotch of St. James on Jeremy Street in London. So I said to him, when are you going to write me a song then, Paul? He said, aye, I will then. And not long after, he sent a song round to my house, which was The Long and Winding Road. But the condition was that I could do it, but it had to be my next single. You see, no one knew what was going on with the Beatles, especially what was going to happen with the Let It Be project. Things were too chaotic, so Paul, not wanting to let a good song go to waste, offered it to Tom Jones in an effort to get the song out. Tom continues, Paul wanted it out straight away. At that time, I had a song called Without Love, and I was going to be releasing. I had asked if I could stop everything and just do The Long and Winding Road. They said it would take a lot of time, and it was impractical, so I ended up not doing it. Imagine loving your song so much, you don't mind if you don't get to be the father. That's like some King Solomon stuff right there. John Lennon had pretty much nothing to do with the composition of this song, and when he was asked about it, he simply says, That's Paul's. He had a little spurt before we finally split up. I think the shock what was happening between Yoko and me gave him the creative spurt for Let It Be and The Long and Winding Road. That was the last gasp from him. Here's a fun twist. Since they had set out to perform the songs with no overdubs as it is a live performance, someone other than Paul had to play bass, and well, rhythm guitarist John Lennon was entrusted with the task. But John really wasn't a bass player and struggled quite a bit to get anything right. Paul actually starts to move his mouth as he does when sussing out a bass line so John can get an idea of his intention, which John does seem to follow. Listen to this clip and you can hear how much difficulty John is having with that bass. The bass may share four strings with the guitar, but they are not the same instrument. This one is a doozy. A lot of people question why everyone seems to hate Spectre, which I don't really get, but if being a murderer doesn't turn you off from him, then his insane way of producing music might just be the ticket, which is still weird. The murdering is worse. Anyway, Phil Spector was brought in to oversee the production of the soundtrack album for the Let It Be film. The problem was Spector has some unusual ideas, kind of random ideas for the long and winding road. Instead of just asking Paul if he could, Spector decided to start adorning the song in huge orchestral and choir overdubs. This would ultimately upset Paul quite a bit, but he's not the only one. It is said Spector was practically insane. I mean, you know. Technical engineer Brian Gibson remarks on working with him, saying, Phil Spector is one of the weirdest persons I have ever met in the recording industry. He's totally paranoid, a most odd character, extremely insecure. He has that famous Phil Spector sound that consists of a lot of echo and everything. But whereas all the record producers that I've encountered have in the back of their minds the way a song will sound when finally mixed, at the recording stage they tend to leave tracks completely dry, perhaps with just a bit of monitor echo, but certainly without any of the effects added later. Spector worked in the complete opposite way. He wanted to hear it while it was being recorded, exactly the 
way it would sound when finished. With all the tape echo, plate echo, chamber echo, all the effects, this was horrendously difficult in EMI Studio One, which is technically quite primitive. Spectre was on the point of throwing a big wobbly, I want to hear this, I want to hear that, I must have this, I must have that, when Ringo took him quietly aside and said, look, they can't do that, they're doing the best they can, just cool it. Spectre wanted everyone to know who he was, he liked to assert himself. Paul was furious at these changes, seriously, he was not okay what was happening to his song. Paul says, a few weeks ago, I was sent a remix version of my song, The Long and Winding Road, with harps, horns, an orchestra, and a woman's choir added. No one had asked me what I thought. I couldn't believe it. The record came with a note from Alan Klein saying he thought the changes were necessary. I don't blame Phil Spector for doing it, but it just goes to show that it is no good me sitting here thinking I'm in control, because obviously I'm not. Anyway, I sent Klein a letter asking for some things to be altered, but I haven't received an answer yet. That letter states very bluntly how Paul felt as he got right down to the problems. It reads, Dear Sir, in the future, no one will be allowed to add to or subtract from a recording of one of my songs without my permission. I had considered orchestrating the long and winding road, but I decided against it. I, therefore, wanted to alter to these specifications. 1. Strings, horns, voices, and all added noises to be reduced in volume. 2. Vocal and beetle instrumentation to be brought up in volume. 3. Harp to be removed completely at the end of the song and original piano notes to be substituted. 4. Don't ever do it again. Signed Paul McCartney. And the response was no. Inspector's version was what went forward until, of course, Let It Be Naked, where they removed a very many things. Paul eventually re-recorded it with his old partner in crime, George Martin, years later. Well, that's it for today, everyone. That was a particularly nice story, wasn't it? Be sure to join the Cavern Club here to keep the party going, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>